I'm here today, and I have this great honor to meet and introduce one of my absolute favorite authors, who also happens to be a very kind and friendly gentleman and uniquely inspiring advocate for children's literacy, John Cheska. So I have decided to take on the persona of Robot Zot, one of Mr. Cheska's darling characters, with enormous courage and fortitude, and who is impervious of his three inch tall stature to get through this introduction. John Cheska started his career as an elementary and middle school teacher. He taught in the classroom for 10 years, and I understand that his teaching experience is what largely informs and inspires much of his writing. My school media center can't keep his books on the shelves because children love his one-of-a-kind clever creativity, his sarcastic, ironic sense of humor, and his raw honesty that makes adults laugh out loud and children sometimes drop their jaws. Mr. Cheska has been writing books for children for the past 25 years. He has written many best-selling and award-winning books for children of all ages, from his Truck Town series for preschoolers to his witty Time Warp Trio historical fiction chapter series that happens to have the greatest titles on the shelves. However, being a beloved award-winning author is not his only great contribution to children's literacy. He is the founder of Guys Read, a nonprofit organization that promotes literacy for boys. Boys, as a mother of two and a teacher of many, boys are near and dear to my heart. And I share his concern that many boys do not enjoy reading and therefore do not read as much or as well as their female peers. Mr. Cheska's solution is simple and effective. His philosophy is that boys do like to read. They just like to read guy stuff. So he writes guy stuff. And he finds other books that guys like to read and puts these recommendations on his guys read website. His website is one of my favorite book list resources in his Guys Read Anthology series, a collection of short stories by dozens and dozens of respected male authors growing up all boy, are favorites of my oldest son and many boys in my school. He's the first advocate to publicly plead to parents and educators to please let boys choose. Let boys find what they like to read. In 2008, John Cheska was named our country's first national ambassador for young people's literature. He spent his two-year term celebrating children's authors and illustrators, inspiring children and adults to embrace and love books as much as he does, and to try new books, try new genres, and to get kids reading. What often gets kids reading is humor. Mr. Sheska knows this and brings humor into all of his books. His first book, The True Story of the Three Little Pigs, is loved by all kids and teachers as their favorite favorite, absolute favorite example for teaching point of view, as it holds the wolf's account of what really happened between him and those three very rude pigs. The Frog Prince continued, the alternative ending that does not bring happily ever after to the strangers of the pond. I first learned Mr. Sheska's work as a teacher, but it wasn't until I had two sons of my own and had the luxury of rereading their favorite books night after night that I became his biggest fan. Even after countless readings of our favorites, Cowboy and Octopus, Stinky Cheese Man and Other Fairly Stupid Tales, Squids Will Be Squids, Knucklehead, I cannot read them without giggling out loud. I'd like to thank Mr. Sheska for giving us the books our kids can't put down that inspire them to write great stories of their own and trigger belly laughs from each of them. I need to let the man you came to see come up on stage. Please join me in welcoming here at our Gaithersburg Book Festival, the one and only John Sheska. Now I'm gonna let Laura come back up and just talk for like another 10 minutes. I don't get this at home. Wow, but it, actually it, it's exactly what I hoped my books would do, um, is to reach an audience in that way and to reach guys, and it, or just inspire all readers. So today, um, I thought I would do a couple things. Uh, a good friend of mine, Mac Barnett is here, the gentleman in the coat. Come on up, Mac. So we thought as long as Mac was around, um, he and I did a presentation earlier today. Could you just, could you give me an introduction though? Like, a, like I want one of those nice ones? One of those? Yeah, oh, oh yeah, I wrote a lot of one for you here, Mac. <laughs> Mac Barnett wears saddle shoes. You're just, That's all we know about him, the end. Just, just say what you see, just say what you see. Enough? That was great. <laughs> That's all I got. Yeah. No, actually, Mac Barnett's a good friend of mine and fellow author who gets all kinds of kids reading with humor. Um, and with picture books, they're inventive. 
And that's the thing Mac and I love together. We love making kind of smart, funny books because we realize our audience is incredibly smart and funny. So today we thought we would just mess around and, and read a bunch of different books for you. We, earlier, we didn't get to read all of our books, so we went back to the book tent and got some more just to keep reading them. We really like our books. <laughs> We're very impressed with ourselves. That's why our respective wife and girlfriend often send us out on the road. Yeah. They're think, very happy. <laughs> they're fine that we're out here. So maybe, I thought maybe I would first yeah. tell you a little bit about how I became a writer. Um, and Matt can tell you some, too. You better mic yourself, I think, for yeah, this. because right. I'll just stand. Oh, I'll just stand. I'll just stand. I'll just stand not behind a podium. That's fine, John. <laughs> this, this is a more powerful podium. Yeah, I know. You feel, you feel very powerful right now. And it's, oh, no, it's, the sound guy's looking at us. It's fuzzy, too. Don't do that. It's fuzzy. <laughs> Don't touch anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a Chia podium. Thank you. <laughs> Wait, how did we get on the podium? We're wasting How did you get on the podium? The because I want a podium. You. The sound guy is just coming up, and do he's going to attack you. Oh, boy. That's bad. Thank you. <laughs> a very generous estimation. <laughs> Make, making me feel like a little less of a man now. All right. Nothing awkward. Uh, <laughs> Mac is a very good writer. <laughs> Terrible illustrator. He just com he thinks he's way better than he is. How did you become a writer, John? Oh, uh, I became a writer. Um, and in fact, another thing that kids ask me is where I get my ideas, which I love. Uh, and I get a lot of my ideas because I grew up with five brothers and no sisters. And we drove my mom crazy just by wrestling all the time. So one of my favorite books that I wrote is Knucklehead. Oh, <laughs> which is the story <laughs> of growing up Sheska. Um, and it was kind of one of the most fun to write just because I didn't have to make anything up. I could just write about the things we did. Like my brother Jim and I deciding it would be a good idea to pee on the electric space heater. Doesn't sound like a good idea. No, it turned out to yeah. not be a good idea. Yeah. We'll we thought we would put this. it out like we did campfires. Right. It works. We put it out. Right. But fried urine. <laughs> different kind of thing. Yeah. So, <laughs> so <laughs> other stories in here which are a little nicer were about like how we used to watch our brothers. Because my mom always told us to watch our brothers. So we would watch Greg roll off the couch and hit his head. We would watch Brian eat the dirt out of the plants. And we would watch Jeff play in the toilet. Because my mom didn't say we had to do anything. She just said, watch your brothers. So we did. Um, how am I going to get to how I became a writer from here? I don't know, but you're the one who said that that's what you were going to tell. It wasn't. <laughs> yeah, I that was I, not my question. Maybe I was lying. How about this podium, though, huh? The podium <laughs> is nice. It's kind of fuzzy on top, too. <laughs> Unlike some people. <laughs> no. Hey. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> yeah. Hey. <laughs> hey. I may have regretted bringing this guy up here. <laughs> Darn. <laughs> All right, so I became a writer because I loved reading books when I was a kid. Like in our family, like about half of us liked reading. The other half of us didn't. But I loved reading Dr. Seuss. Uh, Go Dog Go was another one of my favorite books. The Carrot Seed. And I, I think I always thought, you know what, this would be fun to do. But I didn't know anyone who was a book writer. Um, I knew like my mom was a nurse. My dad was an elementary school principal. And that was about it. I yeah, it was a, I, my mom was a nurse. My dad was a doctor. I didn't know any writers either. But I was the same thing. I was reading all the time. I loved reading books. I loved telling stories. And I loved sleeping in. And those three things. And not wearing pants. And I do. This is the first time I've been wearing pants in eight weeks. <laughs> so writing very is happy a to very be here. good job. Very happy to be here. <laughs> so I went from, although I also was going to, for a while, become a doctor, because my mom said that's an easy job. She said you can make a lot of money and not work hard. I think she said that because she was a nurse. But I thought that still sounded great. So I studied medicine until dissection class. And I love to tell kids, that's kind of where I realized I wouldn't make a really good doctor. Because we did stuff like, first we dissected worms, which was a little gross. Then we did frogs, which was a little bigger and grosser. Then we dissected baby pigs, 
which was kind of a little bit grosser. Then sharks, then cats, and I was worried what was going to come in next. So what the teacher brought in next was the most disgusting thing ever. It was a cookie tray. But it didn't have cookies on it. It was a cookie tray full of cow eyeballs. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. I almost threw up. Right now. And now. I'm throwing up a little bit right now. Yeah. So I thought I'd make a terrible doctor, because if I was your doctor, you'd say, oh, look at my eye. It's got some stuff in it. And I would look up at your eye, and I'd go like, Egh! and then throw up on you. And then no one would come to my office ever again. So I, st- I went to New York, studied to be a writer, got a master's in fiction writing, and painted apartments, which is what you can do with a master's in fiction writing. Even the little guys love the MFA <laughs> joke. Yeah, yeah MFA humor. It's a big one. <laughs> and then I was still painting apartments, and I realized i got to get another job. Uh, and I heard about a job teaching first grade was available. They needed another first grade assistant teacher because they had obviously wrecked the first one. It was a weird class. I should have asked what happened to her. But I started teaching at this school, and I taught there for like 10 years, first through eighth grade and found my audience. And it was my second graders who are just like the craziest people around. Are there any second graders in here? Oh yeah, look at them. Oh yeah. Crazy crazy gleam in their eyes. (laughs) How about some third graders? Oh, we got third graders too. This is a tough crowd. All right, yeah, Yeah, man. But that's the kind of crowd Mac and I love. Because this is an audience who really believes the story. So I still get letters, actually, from the true story of the three little pigs from first graders. Oh, spontaneous hey, wow, look applause. at that. That was spontaneous. <laughs> I'm jealous. <laughs> One of my favorite letters, they, they come in and they say things like, um, you are a bad wolf. You should be in jail. <laughs> Love, Jennifer. <laughs> That's the kind of audience That's you nice. like, right? Yeah, <laughs> so... Um, I took off a year from teaching just to write, got a bunch of stories rejected. Uh, finally, someone said, well, let's, we'll give this one a try. We don't like it, really. We don't think it'll work. We think kids won't understand it, but we might publish it. So it got out there, and it just sold a bazillion, which was nice. And now it's all over the place. And then I got to re- write more stories that they didn't like. Or I brought them back, and they became the Stinky Cheese Man. Yeah. Look at, look at that. I'm going to pay the guy in the okay, Lays. Yeah, there. absolutely. I think you can pay him in Lays. <laughs> yeah. like, that's going to be yeah, easy. Yeah. That's win-win. <laughs> because originally I sent these stories out and got some incredible rejection letters from publishers. And I think it was because of stories like this. If you can imagine this story without the illustrations, you could see you might be a little disturbed. So here's the story of the really ugly duckling. Once upon a time, there was a mother duck and a father duck who had seven baby ducklings. Six of them were regular-looking ducklings, but the seventh was a really ugly duckling. Everyone used to say, what a nice-looking bunch of ducklings. All except that one. Man, he's really ugly. Now, the really ugly duckling heard these people, but he didn't care because he knew that one day he would grow up to be a swan. And he would be bigger and look better than everybody in the whole pond. Well, as it turned out, he was just a really ugly duckling. And he grew up to be just a really ugly duck. (laughs) The end. (laughs) I wish you would have been around like 20 years ago. (laughs) Because from this book, I actually, when I sent these stories out, I got great personalized rejection letters. And Matt can probably tell you, we both got rejection letters where they would just send us a form letter. It would just say, dear Mr. whatever your name is here, uh, this book's not quite right for us. But for this book, I got, dear Mr. Skazukovskaba, do not ever send us any stories. 
That's a little yeah. mean. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that book right there, and that's what th this is the book. That is why I became a writer. I read that book uh, when I was 21, and I was like, if stories this crazy uh, are are out there and have shiny stickers on them, <laughs> <laughs> then maybe some of the weird stuff in my head might work. Uh, and I actually, I, uh, throughout my 20s, uh, I had the entire text of that memorized just from reading it over and over again to four-year-olds. And yeah. we know, too, like, that's... And we know that you as a parent, like, have to put up with stories. So it's, it's our mission to make sure those stories are good enough. Yeah. Mac, what, have you, what did you bring? You should bring some stuff. I got a shiny Speaking sticker. Speaking of Look shiny that. stickers, hey, 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 that's all right. Mac yeah. was a recently awarded a Caldecott honor. Technically, we are not awarded these, though. They go to the illustrator. We are merely the authors of Caldecott honor-winning books. That's going to change starting right now. However, this book also won the E.B. White Award, which is all mine. <laughs> it's not all mine. It's not all mine. You didn't share that with the illustrator? <laughs> yeah. Oh. Um, but yeah, this is a book called Extra Yarn that I wrote. Um, this one yeah, here. read that one. All right, I'm going to read you guys a little. This is a little extra yarn here. If you can't see the pictures, that's all right. Don't worry about it. I'm not that interested in them either. <laughs> <laughs> see, the author and the illustrator usually work very closely together. <laughs> all right, extra yarn by me. <laughs> <laughs> Illustrated by John Clausen. On a cold afternoon in a cold little town where everywhere you looked was either the white of snow or the black of soot from chimneys, Annabelle found a box filled with yarn of every color. So she went home and knit herself a sweater. And when Annabelle was done, she had some extra yarn, so she knit a sweater for Mars, too. But there was still extra yarn. And when Annabelle and Mars went for a walk, Nate pointed and laughed and said, you two look ridiculous. You're just jealous, said Annabelle. No, I'm not, said Nate. But it turned out he was. And even after she'd made a sweater for Nate and his dog and for herself and for Mars, she still had extra yarn. At school, Annabelle's classmates could not stop talking about her sweater. Quiet, shouted Mr. Norman. Quiet, everyone. Annabelle, that sweater of yours is a terrible distraction. I cannot teach with everyone turning around to look at you. Well, then I'll knit one for everyone, Annabelle said, so they won't have to turn around. Impossible, said Mr. Norman. You can't. But it turned out she could. And she did, even for Mr. Norman. And when she was done, Annabelle still had extra yarn. So she knit sweaters for her mom and dad, and for Mr. Pendleton, and Mrs. Pendleton, and for Dr. Palmer, and for little Lewis. <laughs> she made sweaters for everyone, except Mr. Crabtree, who never wore sweaters or even long pants, and who would stand in his shorts with the snow up to his knees. No sweater for me, thanks, said Mr. Crabtree. So she made Mr. Crabtree a hat. And even then, Annabelle still had extra yarn. She made sweaters for all the dogs and all the cats and for other animals, too. Soon, people thought, soon Annabelle will run out of yarn. But it turned out she didn't. So Annabelle made sweaters for things that didn't even wear sweaters. Mailboxes, birdhouses, regular houses. What? Things began to change in that little town. News spread of this remarkable girl who never ran out of yarn. And people came to visit from around the world to see all the sweaters and to shake Annabelle's hand. One day, an archduke who was very fond of clothes sailed across the sea and demanded to see Annabelle. Little girl, said the Archduke, I would like to buy that miraculous box of yarn, and I'm willing to offer you a million dollars. No, thank you, said Annabelle, who was knitting a sweater for a pickup truck. <laughs> the Archduke's mustache twitched. Two million, he said. Annabelle shook her head. No, thanks. Ten million, shouted the Archduke. Take it or leave it. Leave it, said Annabelle. I won't sell the yarn. And she didn't. So that night, the Archduke hired three robbers to break into Annabelle's house, and they stole the box and took it to the Archduke, who set off across the snow and sailed over the sea back to his castle. 
the Archduke put on his favorite song and sat in his best chair. Then he took out the box and he lifted its lid and he looked inside. His mustache quivered. It shivered. It trembled. The Archduke hurled the box out the window and shouted, Little girl, I curse you with my family's curse. You will never be happy again. But it turned out she was. And that is the end of that story. Ladies and gentlemen, Mac Barnett with a happy story for a change. I know, finally. This is such a good, <laughs> such a good twist. It doesn't end with the kid miserable. <laughs> no. Well, Mac and I love to read all different kinds of books. I mean, that's what we really have fun doing. Um, like, we read every picture book possible, middle grade fiction, YA stuff. Yeah. And we love just sort of like encouraging people to read all different kinds of stuff. And we know our audience is really incredibly smart, so we have to just like, I don't know, we try all these different things about books we love, about storytelling we love. Um, and that's why I wanted to show you, uh, both Mac and I do some middle grade fiction. I've got a series called Space Heads. Um, and I think even Mac will agree, this has some of the best writing in the universe in it. It's true, it's true, it's true. I also write a middle grade series and it, the writing is much better in this one. <laughs> and in fact, there's one chapter in particular in here. Well, I should set this up a little bit. Uh, this is called Space Heads, and it's about aliens who invade Earth. And they want to take over Earth, but they're not really bright aliens because everything they've learned about Earth, they've learned from watching advertising on television. So they're a little fuzzy on what Charmin toilet paper actually does. They think it actually makes large bears very happy. It's their best guess. Because if you think about that commercial, like the big blue bear goes, it's ultra strong. And the big red bear goes, it's ultra soft. And then the little bear comes out with stuff on it. It's like, yeah. Yeah, yeah they disappear behind a tree and yeah. come back smiling. And it's kind of like deodorant. You never see deodorant put on anywhere you'd actually use deodorant. It's on someone's arm. And I was always, and in fact, I think this comes from my childhood with five brothers. I was very puzzled by Kotex. Is this a time to I think you should move on, this? John. Read that chapter. <laughs> I just read that chapter. I wanted to buy some. Yeah. Because it could help you swim better, right. apparently. Right. Ride horses. Yep. Good for camping. It's Climbing a, you fences. You when you're camping. And wearing white pants, apparently. <laughs> Which John also loved to do as a kid. I like he all always stuff wore white pants. So I tell my mom, we should get some of that. It's great. She was like, no, let's not. Where was I? Space hands. <laughs> So they do buy Sure deodorant because it gives them 24 hours of protection. Um, and they disguise themselves as fifth graders. So there's three aliens. One disguises itself as a fifth grade boy named Bob, who loves My Little Pony, because who doesn't? Another alien who disguises itself as a fifth grade girl named Jennifer. And the leader of the pack, is the alien who disguises itself as the fifth grade class hamster, Major Fluffy. So they, on the first day of school, they tell Michael K, Michael K, we're spaceheads from another planet. We need your help. And Michael K says, please don't sit next to me. You're going to ruin my reputation. But they follow him around all day long until finally on the playground, Major Fluffy sticks his head out of Bob's pocket. And he says, eek, eek. And Bob said, oh, that's right. You are the leader of this whole mission. You should explain it. So chapter 5A, this is what actually cemented my reputation as the most brilliant writer ever. Humbly, I say this. Yeah. No, that's just something that's out there on a, on a blog. Yeah. JohnSheska.blogspot.com, <laughs> which I thought was suspicious. No, no. I, someone put that up. I don't know who. Just right. Probably Laura. <laughs> she changes her name all the time. Actually, I read this chapter to Jeff Kinney, you know, the guy who wrote Diary of a Wimpy Kid? He cried <laughs> like a baby. Yeah. It was, it was hard to watch. Yeah. Oh, and then I read it to that lady who wrote the Harry Potter books. What was her name? 
J.K. J.K. Rowling. So I read it to her, and you know what she said? She said, I quit writing. I'm not going to write anymore. That's right. She burned Harry Potter 8 at that point. Yeah. And it was, it, was, it was pretty good, too. I was excited. I feel a little bad about that, but I can't control other people, so I just do what I do, right? Yeah. So, should I read this to you? Are you ready? It might change your life. It could crush your dreams. It could also crush your dreams, right? <laughs> good, we're back into that Mac Barnett groove. <laughs> so, chapter 5A. Major Fluffy explains everything. This is a little bit of a spoiler alert also. There's four books in the series, so if you don't want to know everything, don't listen to everything. Chapter 5A. Eek, eek, said Major Fluffy. Eek, eek, eek. Week, week. Week, week, eek, eek. Eek, 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 eek. Eek, 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 eek. Week, week. Weak, 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 weak. Wee, wee, ee, 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 eek. Eek, eek. Eek, eek, eek. Eek, eek. Eek, eek, eek. Eek, 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 eek. Eek, eek, eek. Oh, wait, I read that wrong. Wee, ee, 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 eek, eek, eek. Eek. Eek, eek. Eek, 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 eek. Eek, eek. Eek, eek, eek. Eek, eek. Eek, weak, weak. We, 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 eek, eek, eek. Weak, eek, weak, eek, eek. Yes, there's an entire chapter written in hamster. I wish, I, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we do, we drop the book. When something really That's cool happens. <laughs> Mac and I are working on some of our author moves. <laughs> yeah. We thought that would be a good one. We're not yeah. sure. Maybe not. <laughs> so the good news is, in Chapter 2, a dog comes up to Major Fluffy. And the dog goes, woof, woof. And Major Fluffy looks at him and he goes, woof, woof. Bark, bark. Bark, bark, woof, 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 tail slobber. Slobber, slobber, tail, tail, tail wag. Whole chapter in dog. That's good. That's good. That's good. You can't top that. Uh, yes, I can. Okay. Book three. He goes to Michael K's baby sister. And Michael K's baby sister says, Goo Goo Gaga. <laughs> Guess what Major Fluffy says back? What does he say back? Goo Goo Gaga Goo Goo. Oh, goo Goo Goo. Goo 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 Gaga. Goo Goo. Goo 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 Goo. Goo Goo Gaga. Goo 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 Goo. Goo Goo. Okay. Gaga. Gaga. Goo Goo. Just ga, 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 ga. Seems Goo. like maybe. There's a whole chapter. Okay. <laughs> okay. This is book two and three, you said? Uh, yes. They're book one, two, and three. That sounded amazing. Oh, oh right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> it's not working. It's not working. It's not working. And then book four is coming out. And I can't tell you what happens in that because it's too scary. What happens in that? I can't tell you. But Mac, would you read something from Brixton Brothers? Yeah, yeah. Do you yeah, have right. that? Yeah. Because Mac has a series called Brixton Brothers, which is one of my favorites. I write a, I write a mystery series called The Brixton Brothers. Um, I, I love detective books. I love, uh, you know, I, I read, especially in, as a kid, I read a ton of Hardy Boys books. That was my favorite. And my dream was to collect them all. They're like over 60. And if you've never read a Hardy Boys book, they're about two brothers, Frank and Joe Hardy. And they ride around on motorcycles and solve crimes over and over again. And you really times. don't need to read all. You don't 60. need to. <laughs> you <laughs> read you five. It's kind of yeah, the same. It is. Uh, yeah, and it's true. I mean, it's always the bad guy is always like if anybody uh, has a limp, or <laughs> yeah. is left-handed, or red hair. Red that's hair. the bad guy. Bad that's guy. who did it in a Hardy Boys book. Or basically, the only character who's not Frank or Joe Hardy is usually <laughs> the bad guy. And where so, does Dad go all the time? Well, he, yeah, he, Fenton, Hardy, Fenton Hardy is the most important detective in the United States of America. I guess he's got to travel. It was, I, I always wonder, too, like, why? Because they live in this tiny town, Bayport. It's tiny, but it has enough to support four detectives. Fenton <laughs> Hardy, the most important detective, the best detective in the United States of America, lives in a small town. That makes sense. Yeah. Then Frank and Joe Hardy, and then also Oscar Smuff, who is the worst detective in the United States of America, but still manages to sustain his business. It's a good what place. is going on in Bayport? <laughs> it's like Twin Peaks. I don't understand. Um, 
but but I I love the Hardy Boys. I love them for a lot of reasons. But one reason I love them is you know how everybody has secret fears, right? Like maybe you're afraid of the dark, or or you're afraid of clowns, or you're afraid of flying, or snakes, or flying snakes. Yeah. No, it's not funny. If you're not afraid of flying snakes, you should be. Because what happens is, is they fly up and they bite you in the face. It's a bad situation. <laughs> yeah. Mac, I'm scared now. Sorry, John. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> but my fear, I was afraid of getting kidnapped. And I would think about it all the time. I would actually really <laughs> worry about it. Yeah, we're going there, John. We're going there. But the Hardy Boys books were great. Were you a sickly child? Yeah. I yeah. wasn't good at running. <laughs> All right, that explains a lot. Uh, the Hardy Boys, you know, they get kidnapped all the time. They get kidnapped like once per book. Yeah. And then their best friend, this guy, their chum, Chet Morton, that dude gets kidnapped like nine times in every book. It's like his whole character is he gets kidnapped and eats sandwiches. And that's it. That's his whole, that's his whole reason for being. But uh, the Hardy Boys had this trick. I'll never forget this. Whenever a bad guy would come into the room to kidnap him, they would flex their muscles as hard as they could. The bad guy would tie him up with rope and then leave, and then the Hardy Boys would relax, and the ropes would fall to the ground. And then the Hardy Boys would fight their way out of whatever sea cave or old mill they were being held captive <laughs> in. And when I read that, I was like, this is it, this is my trick. And so I called up my friend, I was like, Sean, you gotta get up here. I have an experiment for us that's important for our safety and our well-being. And Sean came up to my house and we didn't have any rope, so we got my mom's jump rope. I just stood there flexing, you know, I was flexing so hard, you know, I could feel it in my neck, you know, you flex so hard, your neck gets all tight. And Sean started tying the rope around me, he was a boy scout, so he knew all these crazy knots, and I said, okay, watch this, you know, I could barely talk, I was flexing so hard, I said, one, two, three, and I relaxed, and the ropes just stayed there. <laughs> I realized the Hardy Boys worked out a lot harder than I did. And then Sean couldn't get any of the knots untied. I don't know why they're only teaching Boy Scouts to tie knots. It feels like there should be a knot untying badge. No, there is not. Because, yeah, there's not. And the problem is when there's not, then your mom comes home and she yells at you for like two and a half hours because you cut her rope off into a lot of pieces so you could escape from it. (laughs) And then she makes you buy her new jump rope, and that costs $25, which why is it $25 for a piece of rope with some wooden handles on the end? That's outrageous. And I'm still angry about it. You still are a little bit. <laughs> a little bit's coming out. <laughs> Thank you guys for all being here. <laughs> it was the first time that I realized that maybe the tricks that I was learning from these books didn't work. So that's what the Brixton Brothers is. It's about this kid, Steve Brixton, who goes around solving crimes. He's an old school kind of Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew style detective techniques, and they don't work. And he ends up embarrassing himself and injuring himself. <laughs> I was like, you know, like uh, the other thing they were always talking about was like, this is, this is a classic Hardy Boys thing. They'd be like, they would always be jumping off of trains and tall buildings and they'd be like, it's fine. It's really easy to do this. All you have to do is you just roll when you hit the ground. That's not true. <laughs> That's not, why are we telling kids this? Yeah, that was probably that not was, a good idea. Yeah, I'm glad that I didn't have a fear of heights. I was glad I'm afraid of kidnapping. I wouldn't be here today. You got that weird scar in your I leg know. too. I know, yeah, it's true. That's my hey, train jumping. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, Steve has to, you know, Steve has to jump off at one point in this book. He has to jump off the second story of a police station and he's just thinking, he's like, roll, 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 right? And he jumps and he's thinking about rolling so hard that he kind of forgets how far you fall when you jump off the second story of a police station and, and how fast. And, and he just lands on his feet, twists his ankle, falls on his back. Pain is just shooting up his leg. You know, the wet grass is, is soaking through the back of his shirt. He's just in, in just terrible pain. And then he rolls over once. <laughs> it doesn't feel any better. That's the Brixton Brothers. Yeah. <laughs> wow. See, so you can learn a lot from reading too, kids. <laughs> like what not to do. So today I think we've learned don't pee on your electric heater. Right. The rope trick doesn't work. Right. Any other lessons we want people to take away? Uh, I, this is a little too high for a microphone. <laughs> That's what I learned. That's a good lesson, too. Well, I think w- I'd like to leave you with just a story from my memoir, Knucklehead. Um, and it was ma- the story that kind of started it all. Um, <laughs> It's not the story called Crossing Swords, because that's a little controversial. Yeah. (laughs) Or not. Uh, This one is called Car Trip. And it was about all of my brothers and mom and dad. Um, One time we took a car trip 
from Michigan, where we live, down to Florida. And we put all the kids, Jim, John, Tom, Greg, Brian, and the other guy, Jeff, I think was his <laughs> name, <laughs> we're not sure, um, in the car, along with mom, dad, and the family cat. Now, we had a station wagon. It was pretty big. But it was back in the 60s where we didn't actually use seat belts. Um, so Jeff was just on the floor of the baby. And Brian was in a couple of, I think he was on the floor too, maybe. There's the third thing you learned. Store the babies on the floor. <laughs> That's a good thing. That will be fine. So we were driving, 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 until we got somewhere in the middle of the country and stopped at Stucky's because we were hungry. So we all ran into Stucky's and ate a lot of food for lunch. And then we all got back in the car and it was kind of warm. And driving, driving, driving. Brian had also bought at Stucky's one of these gems called the Stucky's Pecan Log Roll. It's a candy bar, which is just a bunch of sugar and some pecans stuck on it. So Brian took a little bite of it and he went like, I don't like this, and he threw it on the floor of the car. That's when the cat found it. So the cat tasted a little bit of it, and the cat thought, wow, this is good. So the cat ate the whole thing, which was fine, until about five minutes later, <laughs> when we heard a terrible sound. We heard that sound of the cat going like, <laughs> and sure enough, the cat puked up the whole pecan nut log right on Jeff, because he was the baby sitting right next to him. I know. And it got worse because then Jeff, being the baby, was kind of going like, oh no, I've got cat puke on me. And then he <laughs> threw up on Brian. I love that impression of a baby. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> what was this? That was what was going on in his head, too. He didn't actually say that. And that's I what makes Sean amazing, is his ability to empathize. <laughs> and then Brian smelled the cat puke mixed with the Jeff barf. And he up chucked on Greg. <laughs> and then Greg started going, ugh, ugh, ugh. That's really what Greg yeah. sounds like. Yeah. And then he Greg. threw up all over everybody. And then Jim and I just started going like, ah! My dad drove off the road. I don't think he hit anyone. <laughs> and he just said, what is going on back there? All you knuckleheads, knock it off. And that's where I learned... Watch out for pecan log rolls. Yeah. There's a no, nice third lesson. There we go. <laughs> kind of, okay, we're stretching a little for a third <laughs> lesson. Uh, yeah, should we take some questions? Yeah, we've got just, just a few minutes. Well, yeah. ten minutes, maybe. Yes. <laughs> questions. The que oh, am I Mr. Crabtree? What, what kind I think of question she's is that? that? Well, I think she's saying that because neither of us wear pants. Wow, right. Oh, okay. No, no. I no. thought she was yeah. just being weird. No, but. Mr. Crabtree's like, a, like just a, yeah. But he's like a, he's he's like a weird, a weird guy who hangs out in the woods with a mug. <laughs> <laughs> That's not on my. Yeah, you're. She seems really like to think that this is. She's like accusing me. Yeah. She's not taking that, that was answer. not me. That was my evil twin. He's got a problem and he's working on it. And he's getting better. So. He is. X nay on the address. <laughs> Yes, here's another question. Oh, we even have a mic. Nice. I got a question. Yes. Um, yeah. <laughs> How did your um, Nutclad story be so funny and comedy? It was about your biography, but why? How did you burn plastic in your base? <laughs> he's, got, he's got a lot of questions about <laughs> Nutclad. Like, what happened in here? Uh, your, question, your question really was, how is that book so amazing and funny? <laughs> yeah, like what kind of life is this? Because it was things we actually got to do. The other one he was referring to is my brother Jim and I somehow found out through the like kid grapevine that if you tie a dry cleaning bag in knots and light it on fire, it drips little pieces of melted plastic. And it makes noises too, like napalm. So we did that on our... It's probably not a great story no, to tell no, either. No, no, no. no, 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 no. <laughs> but I also get letters from kids for this, too. I had a kid wrote me and said, you shouldn't do that at home. It's very dangerous. So we, we did it because we thought it would be fun. That's also the reason why we tied Tom up with my dad's ties to keep him in bed so he wouldn't get out. Not a good, no, no, not not a good a reason good either. A lot of good stuff in here. <laughs> Oh, yes. 
Oh, uh, they unfortunately not selling knucklehead here, but you can buy it in anywhere. Vietnam. It's only illegal <laughs> in Vietnam. <laughs> well, it's also in Sri Lanka. So, yeah, any other store you can order it. Bookstores everywhere. Yeah. Yes. Your stories are really engaging, and the pictures are really engaging. So can you talk a bit about how you work with the illustrators and how, how the illustrator helps to develop the story? Yeah, that's a tricky thing, working with the illustrator, because usually the writer never meets the illustrator. Mac and I are definitely an exception to that rule, because we like working with the illustrators, but we've also learned how to not bug an illustrator. Because there's nothing an illustrator hates more than a writer standing over their shoulder going like, oh, I thought that should be blue, or I like a different kind of blue. It's true. It's not our job. I mean, in a picture book, um, the, the illustration should be telling at least half the story and probably 60, even 70% of the story. Like, uh, and there should be some interesting relationship between the words and pictures. Like the worst kind of picture book would be something that's like, Bobby woke up early, and then the illustration is just him like waking up in bed. It's like, then he went downstairs and it's him on the stairs, and then he had breakfast of bacon and eggs, and you see the bacon and eggs, and that's terrible. That is that is a terrible, terrible book. Like there Or all the description. A lot of times we see books where it says, oh, he was a little bear with green eyes and blue fur, and the clouds were out in twinkling yes. and blue. Let the pictures handle that stuff, and let the pictures contradict the text, or amplify it, or tell a story that the text isn't telling. Um, there should be a kind of interesting relationship. And, and amazing kind of weird things happen, like, in Extra Yarn, when I wrote uh, that lineup of people, like I, I was picturing at the end when it's like Mr. and Mrs. Pendleton, Dr. Palmer, little Lewis, that little Lewis would be a baby, but he's actually like a tiny little bearded <laughs> vaudevillian. Yeah, John made him like a creepy leprechaun Just a or something. creepy, creepy guy. <laughs> and I saw this and I loved it. Our yeah. editor hated it. She wanted us to take it out. She was like, he's too creepy. And yeah. John was like, why, why is he creepy? And she, and she wouldn't say. She was just like, oh, his pose. And his pose, he was just kind of standing there. So John was like, okay, I'll change the pose. And now, now his pose is even creepier. Now he's kind of like, ah, you know, like really. <laughs> no, he's dancing, Mac. Yeah, it's okay. Happy. Yeah, that's how I dance. <laughs> oh, if anybody wants to go dance, dancing tonight. <laughs> um, but then but she wanted him out, but we, we stuck him in. And, and, and actually, at one point, Adam Rex, another guy I work with a lot, knew that this was going on. And he was like, you can't lose little Lewis. Like, he was like, Mac, you don't understand. <laughs> little Lewis is what your soul looks like. <laughs> and this Which is I true. did not know. You never know what your own soul looks like, but apparently there he is. I was going to tell uh, you And that. that's why he's actually, he's the only one who has a decoration on his sweater. Everybody else is just the same pattern, but he gets a little L. And that's because we were celebrating him staying in. But, you know, I would have never written Little Lewis, but John would have never written Little Lewis into it either. He took that text that was there, and I didn't say, this is a baby, and he was like, oh, I know what Mac means, but this is funny. I'll, I'll turn this into something. And that kind of, that kind of amplification and playing around and, and finding these weird spaces in between the text and the picture are where some of, I think, the most memorable moments in picture books come from. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we got one in the back there, yes. How do we come up with the names yeah. for our characters? Well, Stinky Cheese Man came because he was made of stinky cheese. <laughs> I thought I'd start with the easiest first. Yeah, I name, but I, I, sometimes, sometimes they just come to you. Sometimes I name people after, after friends and enemies. Uh, you name the, <laughs> yeah, don't get the, on Max the bad, bad side. characters after the enemy. It's just like that game, I don't know if you guys have ever played that game, Oregon Trail, where you get to name like your, your, your party. Well, what you do as a kid, like what I'd always do, it'd be so exciting. Because you'd go out in the Oregon Trail and then you would, you would come up with a bunch of names and you'd always make yourself in charge of it. And then I'd pick some girl I like and she would be my wife. And then my friends would be my kids. That's weird. And, but then one, you put your enemy on. You put one enemy on. And then, and then it comes up on the screen and it's like, Nate Durhamhammer has typhoid. And then you increase the pace to, and then you decrease the rations. And then he dies. You really are little and Lewis. And that's what you can do. It's called revenge writing. Yeah. And it's wrong. Another thing we But learned. it feels good. <laughs> Excellent. Yes. How did Stinky Cheese Man go to story to story? How does the Stinky Cheese Man go from story to story? He runs and runs and runs. <laughs> And I love that story because my daughter Casey's favorite story was the gingerbread man when she was little. She made me read that so many times that I lost my mind. 
And that's how the Stinky Cheese Man started. <laughs> and that's how John became a writer. <laughs> the book is awesome. Oh, and he thinks the book is awesome. Thanks. Oh, yeah. The other people you can famous. say is awesome, too. Yes. Oh. Julie. Oh, who inspired me to write books? Um, one, my mom and dad, because they read books to me all the time, like Go Dog Go, which I still think is the funniest thing ever. Um, and then also a bunch of writers that I would always read, because all the different writers I think I read made me think, oh, that might be fun to do. How about you, Mac? Oh, that's a good question, John. I bet you like that answer. John is actually the reason <laughs> I, I started writing picture books. Uh, but I, I no. think we, we love a lot of the same writers, and I think we're always interested in kind of taking techniques from fiction that we like and, and seeing how that'll work in a picture book. Um, so I actually, I, my first idea for a book, I, I, I was in college when I had it, and was very much inspired by the Stinky Cheese Man. And I was telling all my friends about it, and they would always give me this look like, this is really weird, Mac. Yeah, what's wrong with you, And so man? I started this disclaimer. I was like, you know what? I know stuff like this works. There's this book called The Stinky Cheese Man. And I was telling two of my friends, and it just became reflexive. I would just say that to preempt their concerns. And I was telling two of my friends who I had breakfast with every week, and I was like, you know, uh, there's this book that, that does this. It's called The Stinky Cheese Man. And, and one of my friends, Casey, was like, you know my dad wrote that, right? And I had no <laughs> idea because I didn't know how to pronounce John's name. <laughs> <laughs> and he just knew my daughter as Casey. I, I actually even so called her funny. Sheska, but I didn't even know how oh, to yeah, spell her name. Because it didn't look like that no, collection of letters. Yeah, I would never in my head put that. <laughs> and so the next day she was like, I told my dad about your book and he wants to see it when you're done. And I met John when he came out and we became friends. And, and, uh, and yeah, I sent him my first book. And it's a good one. Yeah. So you can go find Billy Twitters and his whale problem. Oh, yeah, in the middle. How do you release a book? How do you release a book? That's it's a, a it's challenge. A it's a That's a great one. question. Like a it's kind of tough where you keep sending book companies your story idea, and you try to say, like, oh, I love this story. You should buy it. And they say, no, we hate it. We hate it. Make it sweeter. <laughs> Make it sweeter. Make, Make it the meaner. kid happy. And then we get it back, and we send them again, and we send it again. And it takes a whole year to make a book like this, too, once you get it finished. Yeah, so like when we finish books, like the books that we finish writing, it still is going to be at least two years, probably three years before it comes out. Oh. So all you second graders who raise your hand, like the picture book that I just finished writing, that book's not going to be out until you guys are in fourth grade. You won't even care anymore. No. Yeah, now everybody's sad. You'll see sad. that book comes out, you'll be like, oh, Mac Barnett. Well, I and now I on that, we've got no more two time. Two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for coming. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Mac Barnett. <laughs> John Shuska. We love hey, you. Yeah, yeah. John Shuska. <laughs>